So let me, let's start the class. So I know some of you, some of you I don't, but uh, this is train like you mean it. I have literally spent my life in the SEA training and learning how to train and teaching and learning how to teach better. So everything in this class is distilled and I wrote my own training manual to cover how all this works. If you would like a copy of it, I will put my, let's see if I can find the chat. I'll put my email in the chat and I'll send it to you. But everything we're gonna talk about in, in further detail is, uh, I wrote it down because like everybody else, see if I, well, you know, if I could spell my own email, that would really help. As I get older, I'm becoming a dyslexic typer. So I put my email in the chat. And if you would like my training manual at the end of this class, Seth, I'll, I'll, I'll send it out to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, is, that, uh, is that Duke Gabriel on? I think Duke Gabriel has joined us. Holy cow. Excellent, excellent. So we got folks from, excellent. A few more folks joining. So train like you mean it is a concept that I came up with when I started to, I found myself, let me back up. So I'm Count William. I've been in the SCA since 1981. That's when I first started fighting. I probably should be a lot better than I am, but I can also play the guitar and cook a feast. So it's all, it all, it all weighs out. Uh, I got squired in 88, knighted in 94, Pelican in 95. I'm the premier member of the Middle Kingdom's AOA Fighting Award. I was the first person to ever receive it. I'm a baron of the court and I won crown for my lady at age 51 in 2016. So, I really, really like the SCA and I am 55 years old sitting here and I'm gonna be better 10 years from now fighter than I am right now, I guarantee it because I know how to train. So what is train like you mean it? So train like you mean it is an idea that the time you spend at practice, you can either create some value for yourself or not. And I'm okay with whatever you wanna do. But how you practice defines how you deliver when you have to fight. So we've all been to the practice where you see the guys stand around and talk for two hours and then they go out and they throw maybe 30 passes at each other, practically fall over dead and go talk for the rest of the practice. Hey, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you what to do. But if you want to get better in a noticeable measurable, incremental manner, you, you have to have a plan. So this is how I do it. Um, since it was nice, they were nice to give me 90 minutes, which is really what I like for this class. And I will be teaching this class when the SCA returns out in armor. So if we're ever anywhere and you want me, you want me to, you want to train with me, please come and train with me. I, as some of the folks on this call know, I love to train. I care little for tournaments in general. I'd rather train because the only tournament I care about is crown. I got one more to try and win before I'm probably out of the window of being competitive, but that's a ways off. So if anybody has anything really specific you want me to cover in this class, unmute your mic and answer and I'll put it on our little parking lot here. Otherwise I'm gonna, gonna move forward and you guys can formulate questions as we go. All right. Everybody's got their cameras off. I bet everybody's eating dinner or breakfast in the case of. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move a few things and stand. I'm going to get my easel where we can actually see it. Okay. So why bother with training? So everybody wants to tell you something about training. Well, you know, if you just go and fight for 27 hours every week, you're going to, yeah, okay. As an experiment, there was a stretch from where I live where I was the only knight who was practicing. I wasn't the only knight, but I was the only one who bothered to show up to practice. So I went to three practices a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, one local to me, 20 minutes away, two an hour away. And I was the only, only guy out there with a white belt. 
There were plenty of other nights, but for whatever reason, they just weren't able to, to practice. Okay. So I did that for 14 months. And then my body <laughs> shut down. And this is training the way I train three or four hours a night, 12 hours on top of six hours, five and a half hours of driving. But it was, it was a good lesson. It was a good thing to try to understand what training could do for me and, and what limits my body had. So number one, before I say anything else about training, you have to learn to listen to your body. And I don't mean the voice that says, oh, I'm tired. I mean, the voice that says something hurts. I simply can't drive the frame the way I want to. Stoicism is vastly overrated. Take the time to heal. Seriously. I've been fighting nonstop for 40 years. It took a pandemic to stop me from practicing twice a week minimum. I have never been this long off of fighting in my entire life since I was 16 years old. I don't know what to do with myself. I do have a night friend and we put on masks under our armor when the weather is nice and we fight and we distance when we're not fighting. We fight with masks on. That'll improve your cardio. So why train? Training is simply a tool to take you from where you are to where you wanna go. And whether you get there or not is largely up to you. But if you have a, a method a glide path to get you to climb the mountain. It's a heck of a lot easier, at least in my opinion. So we wanna train so that we can just measurably drive ourselves up, up the hill. And if we do that, we can get better. Yeah, so many of my, so many of my peeps are on this call. Uh, Mistress Gwyneth mentioned, there's a difference between being hurt and being injured. I get hurt all the time. It's a contact sport. You're going to get banged up. If it's not for you, find a different sport. I always teach, when I start with fighting and people say, well, what does it take to be a great fighter? You can be a great, you can be a good fighter with almost any view of fighting. But the people that really excel at the sport in the long haul, when you are fighting and someone just freaking cracks you in the head, in the body, in some place where undoubtedly you forgot that piece of armor or it, it slipped out of the way at the critical moment and it hurts a lot. My personal favorite is the meaty part of the skin that covers your floating ribs. Oh, a lot of pain receptors there. Ask me how I know. So when that happens, 99% of your body should go, ah! 1%, at least 1% should go, yeah. If you don't like pain a little bit, contact sports are not for you. And that is not a value judgment on anybody as a person. Probably it's the reverse of saying that some of us have a mental illness <laughs> about it. But you can wear good armor. You know, you can, I wear a lot of armor. As I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate a good, a good kit. I wear far more armor than I did when I was 20. And you know what? I don't walk away from practice with bruises. It's very rare. Costs you something. There are a lot of guys running around in a padded shirt and minimum armor, and they're all faster than me. But you know what? Fast isn't everything, and fast doesn't last. So that's what training is. So part of what you... What we want to talk about here anyways, is what, what is training? What are we trying to accomplish? So when I load up my 40 pound rig and drive 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 minutes to practice, what am I hoping to accomplish? Well, at practice, I'm trying to do something that makes me a better fighter than I was at seven o'clock by the time it's 10 o'clock. In its simplest terms, that is what practice should be to you. Did I improve from seven to 10 or seven to nine or six to whatever your practice timing is? Did it work on something? And 
one of the things that you got to get past is there are all these mentalities around fighting and most of them either aren't healthy or aren't useful. <laughs> so the first, the first thing in tr that I have in my mantra of training is you got to get past the idea that you can't do something. Now, the SCA is a big, broad place. There are guys out there that I really have no interest in particular in fighting. Doesn't mean I wouldn't fight them. But I don't have a lot of interest in fighting them. They're not fun. They're big bruisers. They want to smash everything. And can I go out and smash them? Yeah, I can. And I can teach you how to hit people so hard they forget their name. It's just not what I'm interested in doing with my time because the precious commodity in this is time. I am not independently wealthy, haven't won the lottery last I checked, which means I get one or two three-hour windows of practice a week to get better. And you got to treat those like they are a pot of gold that you get to spend at practice. So when I go to practice, I get hit a lot. I don't really care. People worrying about winning at practice, that's idiotic. That is flat out stupid. Until you get to the very last part when you fight for the crown, and I'll explain that here in just a sec. You also have to get past all this, uh, what's a really, I'm trying to think of a good word, sort of like audible memes that people use all the time, like steel sharpened steel is my favorite useless bit of hokey quaint advice. Steel sharpened steel, the idea that if you can find somebody better than you, you will get better. That's partially true if they are interested in helping you and if B, you can understand what's happening. The idea that steel sharpened steel is wonderful if you got a lot of steel lying around. But here I was in the mid 90s. Actually, sorry, I started in the early 2000s attending practices where not only was I the only knight, I was in some cases the only authorized fighter. So how do I get better as a fighter when I got 12 college kids who've been fighting anywhere from zero to five months? You have to have a plan and you have to take your ego out of this equation. Ego can be a good thing. It can drive you, it can lift you, it can forge ahead. It can also trip you up. It can also throw you under the bus and it can also run into bigger egos. And then it's a big pissing competition and nobody really learns anything. So when I found myself with one of my students who is now a knight and a baron, standing in the midst of a bunch of college kids who, who we were just trying to get them to hold the right end of the sword. <laughs> you know, I mean, these, this is brand new. How do you fight with people like that and not just blow them out of the water? Left hand single sword levels the playing field very effectively. And let me tell you, the key feature missing in most people's practice is intensity. You can train technique. So you got these two things you're kind of trying to improve. You got our technique over here. Can I hit the mark? Do I hit, does the sword go where I want it to go? That's technique. Technique is just a thing you can work on all the time. And you say, well, throwing blows at the Pell is dumb. Okay, throw them like your molasses on a cold day in November, like at about this speed, as slow as you can throw the blow and finish it and do it over and over again. At 25, your arm will be shaken. That's what I always give to people who say, I'm injured, I can't do anything, I wanna hit the Pell. Okay, slow. Slow is fast, smooth is faster. Technique. But technique crumbles to pressure if you haven't trained your intensity. When you roll out after sparring at practice and not giving it your best effort or paying your best attention, and you roll into some dyed in the wool killer who smokes you like a cheap cigar, what happened? You hadn't trained your intensity. If you train your intensity and your technique, yeah, 
absolutely. Anya posted to Anya is one of my longtime friends and students. Yeah, to teach is to learn twice. You have to learn to do it right to teach it. If you can't explain it, you shouldn't be teaching it. So let's create a framework of training and let's get rid of a few things. Let's get rid of your ego. I can hit a lot of practice. I can hit a lot in tournaments or anywhere else. And when I'm teaching and training, it's okay to get hit if you're working on something. If I'm trying to deliver this blow that I've just not been able to get, if I put all my focus on that, I don't really care what else happens because I will improve that skill. And that's what you're really trying to do is drive up this incremental improvement. You can do it in a complete vacuum. You can, it's harder. If you have a training buddy, it's a little easier because it's always hard as we as fighters. Uh, and I mean, this is all, this works for everything. Heavy, rapier, boffers. I, I spent some time with a foam fighting group when I was traveling for work, which I will be doing again at some point. When one of the places I go, there's foam fighting group. They're, they're great. Nobody's ever taught them how to fight. And so the kid with the best grip and the fastest and strongest wins all the fights. And I went out and just fought with him. And yeah, this is really fast, but it's like it's not a block. So you, when you're not just standing there getting beat by how, or over impressed by how fast that person is, and you go, doink, and you just keep doing it. And everybody's like, what are you doing? That doesn't happen in a minute. It happens in a process. So I think I have it. The other thing is, is if you can get a few people to train with you, so if we go back to our steel sharpened steel analogy, and this is also really good if you're the lead horse at your practice. I've been the lead horse. I've been to practices where you could spot the lead horse. And the lead horse, their skills actually diminish in some cases, or they drive everyone out of the practice because nobody can fight them effectively. So you, you've got this situation where you're the big gun. So what you do is you detriment your technique and maintain your intensity. Okay. And as I train in a group, what I want to do is I want to find the worst fighter in my group and make them 5% better. If I make that fighter 5% better, they're going to, and, and again, we all know how this kind of works, that, that fighting is a cluster sport. You know, you really, one of the things we implemented at all our practices, you warm up with every person there, two passes, three passes, and you move on. Because it's easy to lock in with the person that drives you the hardest and burn out too early and not get the training you need. Plus, how many times have we seen this fighter who does very, very well at the local practice rolls out to some kingdom event and does it, you know, looks like they don't know which end of the sword to hold, but they're a monster at their local practice. They're destroying everyone in sight. What changed? Why don't he, that, that fighter doesn't know who those people are. All of a sudden it's all, it's all clutch and reserve instead of delivering that fight. And so if there are five people in your practice, you should warm up with all five of them. And everybody's got to get into this thought. You may have to meander along in your practice for a while, but the idea is if I can take the lowest skilled fighter and raise them a little bit, they will raise the fighters in their little pod of fighters and those fighters will raise everybody else and all that pressure will come up and push me. Because a rising tide lifts all boats. It's a lot easier to make a, a very middling fighter slightly more skilled than it is to say, well, you know, I'm just gonna train with the best guys. Well, who's the best guys or girls? Because I know some lady knights who will make you forget your name. They can hit you so hard. Okay. So who's the best fighter? Well, the best fighter in our kingdom as an example is, you know, Duke Bronson, whoever that is. Well, let's go fight with him. He's the guy to train with, right? He's the best. Oh, wait, he lives six hours from me. Well, oh, you're not committed. You're just going to make that six hour. <laughs> okay. This is just stupid. This is a dumb way to train. It's idiotic. How about if you and I work on a technique every week? Because my goal is if I'm the better fighter, and, and so another thing to take out of your heads 
is the idea that everyone is better than you. A lot of people use that as a way to drive them. I think that's not a very good way to say it. What I know is every time I face anybody, I know at least one thing in a term, they're authorized. That means at some point they hit, a, they hit somebody or multiple somebody's hard enough to pass an authorization. Ego. So this is my small ego anecdote. So quite a long time ago, we have an event in this kingdom called, turn, uh, called Chivalry Gathering. It's an event just for the Shiv to get together and fight because we never get together. We never get a chance to really fight each other at events. So there was a Duke, a very prominent Duke, visiting from someplace far away. And he had this awesome kit. He made us all. I mean, I'm like, I mean, even back then, I was still wearing kind of a Ska-esque kit. But I was standing there with one of my good friends who's, who was sort of between kits. So you know, his armor sort of looked like an unmade bit. But there was somebody he didn't know. So he said, hey, you want to fight? And the, the Duke looked down at him. Oh, I suppose. And then the Duke got hit about 157 times. In, 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 in joking parlance, uh, the fighter ran up one side of him, beat him on the head, and ran down the other side of him. And, and then, hey, thanks for the fights, and went off to fight somebody else. And, and then the, the Duke was standing there, and he goes, what the heck just happened? And I said, he thought you were better than him, and I, he's been a night longer than me, and I've been a night way longer than you. Just saying. You treat everybody like they could hit you hard enough to cause you to lose a fight, you'll be okay. I just assume all my opponents are skilled. I don't know if they're better than me. I'm going to find that out. Yeah, any fight you start by disrespecting your opponent is going to end badly for you, guaranteed. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but it will. And it'll be, when those falls happen, they're the worst. Some newbie face stabs you, you know, the third round of a tournament when you think you know what you're doing. All your fights, get all your focus and all your attention, cash out your ego, train everybody. I train everyone. I train with guys that I'm going to fight in crown. Why? Because they're the best training partners. And if they beat me on that day, great. I'm happy for them. If I beat them, but we all train together because I want to train with the folks that want to train. I want them to train with me. So rising tide lifts all boats. Okay. Is there anything else we want to try? Right. All right. Doing less than that is training yourself. So I visited a practice, and this happens more than I wish it would happen. I visited a practice, and it was after I, I, I fought a fellow member of the chivalry in a tournament. And we came out, and they said, you know, take your guards. And I got right up to where the marshals were holding the ball. Because this gentleman was younger than me, he's faster than me, he's stronger than me. So I said, better go get him. So, and as he, disdain is, you can't attribute that, as he carelessly guarded himself, I shoulder drop faked and I thrust him dead in the center of the body like a sharp stick. Just, <laughs> So I, he's my friend, I said, hey, thanks for the fight. He's like, what, for target practice? I'm like, don't be that way. I was here to fight. I don't know what you were here to do, but it wasn't to fight. So afterwards, we talk about it, and, and I'm like, are you the best? I bet you're the best fighter at your practice. And he said, yeah. And so here's the next thing to disabuse yourself of. You got to get it out of your head that you are doing anybody a favor by taking it easy on them and laxing your technique to a point that is far below what you're capable of. Now, that doesn't mean we smash novices. What it means is, is that you aren't, you're long, lounging around in practice in second gear. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing if that's what you, as you fight, as you practice, it's how you're gonna fight. So if I'm lounging around, with lazy technique and poor intensity, guess what's gonna happen when I roll into tournament? Lazy technique and poor intensity. This is not a magic trick. It isn't. This is nothing about this is magical. I know a hell of a lot of fighters who are excellent at delivering about half of their potential. Boy, they can, 
they can really second gear it. They're excellent at doing half of what they could do. They're fantastic. And they die in droves. They don't even know what hit them in a tournament half the time. Then they're frustrated and they're pissed off and they're unhappy. And that sucks. That doesn't help you on your journey. Okay. So ego goes out. And if I have, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time on the youth list. Kids have no agendas other than to beat you. Seven-year-olds, div one kids. They want to take the thing and hit you with it as many times as they can. They are excellent training partners if you can figure out a way to level the playing field. So I'm fighting kids on my knees, single sword with a basket hilt for a shield. Sometimes not even the basket hilt. Sometimes left-handed. It isn't one of these. This is a div two buffer. Okay. I can make that fight challenging for me and challenging for them. Because that's what we really got to do. If I'm going to fight you or you or you or any of you, and we're training, we got to find a place where we can both deliver our best intensity to get the most out of it. I mean, I, I, you know, I love training with kids. I have no agendas. Best, one of the best training I ever got was I went to a big event in the western part of our kingdom um, called Festival of Maidens. And my good friend, Master Sean O'Shaughnessy, who is the youth uh, Kingdom's Youth Marshal then asked me, you know, it was a break and the tournaments, it's a kind of a pool thing. And eh, usually I just spend a bunch of time training because I get to see folks there. I don't see anywhere else. Asked me if I'd come to Youth List. And I said, sure. This is about 15 kids. And as I walked in, you know, the white belt, the gold, the whole nine yards in my kit. And man, those kids were like predators. Their eyes were freaking, <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like ages seven to 16. I ended up there two hours, two and a half hours. I had the best time. And I got in some really great training because kids don't always do what you expect them to do. Part of this process is letting your brain get past that there is right and wrong in fighting. If it doesn't hurt your body. It may not be optimal, but getting past right and wrong, too much training is you're doing that wrong. Are you me? Am I you? Am I, have I had the same injuries, the same experiences? Have I put in the same training time? Have I lifted as much weights as you? Okay, that, that's idiotic because you can't copy my style. No one can. Bruce Lee says there's a style for every fighter. Only the fighter can master it. No one can teach it to you, but you can be coached towards it. So this process is about coaching towards your technique. So let's talk about I'm going to just use this one real quick. So when I said about ego, this top line says, what are you afraid of? Except the image is reversed. Oh, I, there's probably some cool thing I could do. I'll just read it off. What it's are fine. you afraid of? Part of it is looking foolish in front of your peer group. Getting your ass kicked at practice. Okay. Oh, good. It's not reversed for you. It's only reversed for me. What are you afraid of? If you can get rid of the fear of looking foolish, and let's face it. I'm wearing 40 pounds of armor. It's ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. So if we get past the idea of ridiculous, then you can just train, okay? What are you afraid of? The only thing that's holding you back from getting better at your art is you, no one else. And if you can get past the idea that, so I get want to practice, what do I care? You know, I had a, a, a gentleman came to a practice this, this one time. He had taken a break from the SC. It was a very, very strong fighter. And I hadn't seen him in a while. I didn't know where he had gone, just kind of disappeared for a while comes to the practice and I'm fighting him and I'm just kind of watching him and he's hitting me a lot. And at the end of practice, he crows about it. Oh, wow. And I said, you know what? You're right. You were the man today. 
See you next week. One year and let him put a and let him put a stick on me. Fought him as hard as I've ever fought anybody and just didn't let him hit me. So what do we ask for? Warm up will give everyone an idea of where they are at. Yeah, I used to be more of a fan of calibration passes. If it's all out fight calibration, as opposed to letting someone hit me in the head unimpeded, okay, I'll go for a calibration pass. You know, what I always say is show me where you want, show me the level with which you wish me to hit you. Okay. For rapier, you don't have this problem near as much. Although I have to tell you, some of the worst bruises I ever got were from rapier passes. But in heavy, my plan is I will calibrate to where you want to calibrate to unless I think it's unsafe, which point I'll tell you. Now, on this side of the lens, I'm Count William of Fairhaven. I'm one of the most well-known peers in the kingdom, if not in other kingdoms. I'm extensively traveled and I have no fear of anybody. I can say what I want. If I think somebody's being a great big rhino shucking pig, I'm going to tell them. I might say it nicer than that unless they're being an absolute jack wagon. It's not always easy to have that conversation. Yeah, Master, Magister Andreas, second worst injury. I have seen more people with broken ribs or rib injuries and rapier than I have seen in my 40 years of heavy fighting. That's what it and was, a broken martial... rib. What's that? That's what it was, a broken rib. Uh, with the group broke a rib. I think he broke two actually. I am a rapier marshal, a heavy marshal, and a youth marshal, and I have been for decades. So, okay. Winning is the only thing, you know. Winning is overrated. It's a binary system of your accomplishments. I won. I'm incredible. I lost. I suck. <laughs> How about, did you land the blow you were trying to throw? Can you land the blow you want to throw? I reframe fighting to me. It's all about just technique. I just, look, I'm trying to hit you. How effective am I at hitting you? If it bends the fight, wonderful. If it doesn't, I guess I'll just go train some more. But I get out of the fighting idea that, you know, crown tournaments, an excellent example in the middle kingdom and probably in other places. There've been a hundred 101 crowns in the history of the Middle Kingdom. Seven of them were won by one guy. Six of them were won by another guy. So 13% of all the crown tourneys in this kingdom were won by two people. Oh, wait, there's a guy who won four. We're up to 17%, three people. We got six three-time crown winners. So that's 18 and 17 is 35. On nine people. Okay. Oh, any given Sunday, somebody can win crown. Statistics say otherwise. Duke or fluke, bull. It is hard to win crown. I trained my ass off. I did two hours of cardio a day for 14 days prior to crown. On top of practicing the week, two weeks out. I never had practiced heavy the week before crown. You know, so uh, not everybody wants to be a knight <gasps> or a mod or whatever. Not everybody wants to be a peer. It's a big job, got a lot of responsibility. Maybe you just want to have fun fighting. And you know what? The guys like that at practice, they just want to swing the stick. It's okay. You need training partners, period. If they've got a different agenda than you, as long as they're not hurting you, don't worry about it. I am the sum of the tens of thousands of fighters who gave me one or more passes ever. A lot of those fighters are gone. And I mean, gone from this earth. A hell of a lot of them don't fight anymore. Every one of them gave me something. So if that person doesn't want to train like I want to train, if they just want to fight, they can be useful. Glad them. Okay. The meat of all of this is this thing. And I'm going to let it cut my head off just a little because I want you to be able to see the whole chart. And there's a much better, my uh, excellent artistic skills here, there's a much better one of these in my fight manual. But 
So I'm just going to put this at the top. Bullying can't be tolerated. There are people in every martial sport, every one of them, every martial sport that are dicks. I can't say it any simpler than I can say it. They, they're just friggin' jerks. They beat up on novices, not at my practices. And in fact, I've tried to raise a generation of peers in this barony that I live in and in surrounding places who won't tolerate this. And when you don't tolerate it at your practice, those people go away. But sometimes they're wearing white belts. Sometimes they're peers. The martial process is there. And if the marshal, local marshal can't help you, you go up. Because the one thing that will make it impossible for you to excel is if you have bullying at your practice. People will leave, they won't train. I've seen people go form their own practices rather than try and deal with a bully. Now, there's nice ways to deal with bullies and there's, hey, but my, my general experience, sadly, bullies will quit bullying, at least in the locality when you bloody their nose bad enough that they know it. In, that can be social, that can be judicial. We can pull cards. And I think the SC is a lot more sensitized to it than it was 40 years ago. So keep that in mind. All right, so I call this chart the planks of prowess. This is, this is the foundation method that I use to train. Every practice should have all of these elements. This is your complete meal of fighting. Now, I made it a box because a box is easy to draw when you have no artistic talent. You don't do all of these. Probably it's, it's more like a diamond. But at the bottom of your process is study. So what's study? Study is we talk about somebody teaches a technique. Hey, show me how to throw a flat snap. Okay. I walk out there and everybody takes five minutes, seven at the outside, okay? These are the quick sound budget, basic technique. You should, my personal rule is 180 seconds. I should be able to explain it to you and have you show it back to me in 180 seconds. And if I can't do that, I shouldn't be teaching it. There are techniques that are more complex. we we'll cover those in a minute. And we do most of the teaching with these. This is a pool noodle over three quarter inch sand and rattan. It is the perfect training implement. Doesn't put a lot of pressure on your joints. And if you want to, you can throw helmets and shields on and go full force with these things. And while they sting a little, you don't really need armor. Okay. So, and we rotate people at practice. Teach us something. What's your move? I want somebody to teach it. Because then it reinforces. We go back to that teaching is learning a second time. Okay, everybody participates as best as they can. Okay, so we got our study component. You should do this at every practice. Pick one technique, ask one person at your practice to teach one thing. It could be something simple. I saw that Baroness Save is just teaching the drop step, this idea of how to move your feet. If you're not familiar with it, I think class is in March. I can't remember why, actually, I, I'm still uh, getting caught up on the calendar, but anyways, uh, it's going to be a cool class. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and take it. Oh, it's Wednesday. Okay, great. Thanks, Everett. Yeah, it's Wednesday. I'm going to try and, oh, it's Wednesday. Sorry, I can't. Wednesday is my wife and I live stream music on Wednesday nights. We actually perform. But I'm going to go watch the replay of it because I think it'll be really good. And she trains with some really good folks and she trains with me too. I really enjoy having her at practice. So highly recommend. Okay. So after studying, we have what's called practicing. So practicing is Slow work is greatly misunderstood, usually done wrong. I'm just going to say it. Here, you know, and I see this kind of thing at a practice, slow work, where guys are like doing these ridiculous character, character moves that you would never do in a fight. So what I think slow work is and how I use it as a tool is it's, Practicing your flat snap, no faster than that. And having somebody with a second set of eyes look and see what you're doing. If you don't have a second set of eyes, use your phone, videotape yourself, video yourself, tape, wow, sorry. Video yourself, 
make a digital recording of some variety with a thing that you probably have in your pocket or in your hand or might even be using to watch this uh, because the video never lies. It's horrendous. I wish it lied uh, because many times I've seen video of myself and it's like, who the hell is that? Oh my God, that technique's terrible. Somebody stole my armor. My God. Anyways, okay. So practices we work and, and we can actually do some swinging. 40% power, 70% speed, 60% speed if we're working on technique, but everything tight, just like you would do it for real. And understand that if I'm throwing this fast, you could easily move your shield to protect, but that's not the point of the drilling or the practicing. Yes, I know that this is pretty easy to block. The point is, am I doing it right? Are you doing it right? If I'm going to hit you like this and you have to rush to get your guard in, your guard wasn't in the right place to begin with. Again, got to change some brain things going on in this process. We really need to think about this in a lot different way. Okay, study, practice, spar. This is what everybody does. Most of the practices I attend are demolition derby and armor. Let's spar, wah bang, wah bang, wah bang. A lot of it's full speed. It has no real sense. It's, you know, sometimes it's, you know, what sparring to me is, when I think of sparring, what I want out of sparring is, I want to be 70 to 75% of what I deliver in a combat fight. But I still have some space, some brain power to make adjustments and work on my technique. These three planks, or where you can work on your technique. I can go out and say, man, I just suck at this. I'm trying to learn. So one of the knights who has been my student since 2000, and he is now a knight and a baron, is a shot. We call it lovingly the harpoon. Because basically, he cuts through your guard to draw your shield across, and then he loops his sword around, brings it back over the top, and stabs you directly over the heart. And you go... Oh, well, if I just hold my shield in the right place. Yeah, it's the famous last words. I've been training with this guy for 20 years. <laughs> and he can still hit me with it. And it's annoying, but no one else can hit me with it. So I'm okay with that if he's the only guy. So those are things you can do in study practice far. Okay. Almost all the practices I attend, almost, not all of them but many practices, especially when I get well outside of central South Ohio where I live, fight. You have to reserve some time at your practice where we are turning off the safety locks, school is over. We are fighting and in all of these process, well, so in these two, take all blows for the crown. Good leg is the dumbest thing I have ever heard at practice. Good arm, good leg. Well, you know, when you get hit like that, for real, you're going to have to change. And while you're thinking about it, I'm going to hit you nine more times because I don't have to give you a break. Certainly, if you don't acknowledge my shot, I'm just going to assume it wasn't good and I'm going to keep hitting you. Okay. This level here is for practicing things like Finishing fights. So, so that my head isn't completely cut off the picture, I am not getting on my soapbox, but here's William's soapbox. Who decides that you have won a fight? Anybody want to type it in there? Your opponent. Whoever said your opponent, that's the correct answer. your opponent. So if your opponent has not given you an indication that you are the victor, you aren't. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. Doesn't mean they're rhino in your blows. You're not, you haven't won a fight. And if you stop and get killed, it's on you. This is the single biggest failing in people's training. And I learned some of this from my night, and I learned some of this from other folks that I've trained with through the years, but I call this, this is a technique. 
I call it teachable. You will call the blows good when you are tired of being hit and I will hit you. If I can hit your leg once, I can hit it five more times. I will keep fighting to the absolute death in a fight because that's the rules. I'm not gonna hit anybody harder. I'm not gonna assume that they're a bad person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Cope, exactly correct, you know. You don't get to say your blow was good. That's a tenant of our sport. And it is in addition, one of my big pet peeves that there are all these fighters that think they are so friggin' good that they just, they throw a goal. I threw the perfect blow. Somebody say that to me in a tournament. I threw the perfect blow. Right. The perfect blow wasn't what hit me. You know, I'm out here trying not to get hit. You got weapons are moving. Bodies are moving. Shields are moving. Everything's moving. The whole fight's in motion. It is very easy for a blow to bleed off enough force, even in rapier, you know, for that blow to no longer be good. And we have to, I, I don't assume that even people who have a higher standard of calibration than I do, I don't assume they're jerks. That's a bad road. Now, some of them are, for sure, but it, you can determine it fairly quickly in a fight. And I say this a lot, training is salvation. I can fight with fighters significantly larger than me physically. I can hit you in the back of the leg so many times. I will sacrifice losing sparring bouts until I have turned your leg into hamburger by repeated blows at nominal force. If you get, if it's to be a jerk collection, I wear a 12 gauge stainless bassinet with a stainless riveted aventail, anti concussion foam padding, and a period liner. You can't hit me hard enough to hurt me. You can't. Well, maybe, but I haven't had it happen yet. Okay. I'm not interested in that as a fighting thing, but you have to start preparing your brain for some of this kind of stupid stuff that happens in martial sports. There's way too much rub some dirt on it, get back in the game and not enough. What are you trying to accomplish? Study, practice, spar, fight is a simple checklist for practice. Did I get all four food groups? The answer is yes. The practice should have improved you at some level. If the answer is no, what didn't you get? Usually study is the first casualty of practice, right up to the point where I hit people with a blow over and over and over and eventually says, damn it, what are you doing? I thought you'd never ask. Here, let me show you. Because if I show you what I'm doing, you're gonna figure it out. And then when you figure it out, it's not gonna work anymore. And I gotta figure out something new. Rising tide lifts all boats, all the time, you know? The, the thing that convinced me of this, and folks who know me have heard this, but there's a lot of folks on this call who, who don't. A million years ago, I was in a fight practice. In, in a, I, was, I would drive to practice in Columbus, Ohio, once a week where my, my night was. It was, I'm sorry, I was a squire. He just got night, it had been about a year. Actually, I think it was that year. And a guy came out and he had a move that nobody had seen. It was a body thrust to a fainted flat snap. Textbook, Fighting 101, but at the time, none of us had ever seen it, and I went out and fought him, and he must have hit me. He hit me four or five times, and I didn't even know what had happened. I couldn't figure out why my shield was not blocking my head. Well, the answer is it was over here, uh, That's, but still learning fighting. I'd only been fighting five or six years at that point, so I said, show me what you're doing, and he said, no. <laughs> what? Okay, again, so it probably hit me 20 times. And I said, okay. And I went home and I didn't go back to that practice for about three or four months. All I did was think about this shot. I thought about it when I was driving to work, when I was in the shower, I had this single-minded focus to, and I figured it out on a pill. I figured out what was happening. Ah, so here's how to throw the shot. Learning how to throw the shot's a good thing. <laughs> Learning how to block the shots a better thing. And 
I devised the defense. Four months-ish later, I go back to the practice. He throws the shot, I block it, and I crack it. And then I throw the shot, and he doesn't know how to block it. And I hit him a lot of times. I just hit him with it a whole bunch of times. And my night came over. Good job. Good job, William. Teach it to everyone here. Yes, sir. I taught it to everybody. And after that, that's how it always works. There are no magic shots. And anybody who thinks they've got a magic shot, use it on me. I'll figure it out. And then your magic shot's not going to work. And if you don't have a method to fix your deficiencies, you know, there is no trick shot. Or maybe it's good once, you know. And even, you know, as reasonably, you, you need to win about 9, 10, 12 fights to win a crown. Shooting your wad with your one magic shot, not having the grounding and basic technique. Because this is all about basics. Get really good. And uh, an analogy I have often used that goes with my training here is you have to decide what works for your brain. How do you like to absorb information? What works for you? Physically doing it, watching other people do it, kind of photographic reflexes kind of thing. Hearing somebody describe it to you writing it down, reading about it. Everybody has different comprehension, but in the big world of martial arts, they're, you know, if we go from simple to complex, way over here in the simple, simplest of all martial arts, in my opinion, is Taekwondo. It has about 20 moves and a master of Taekwondo spends their entire life perfecting 20 moves, okay? You go all the way to the other side, down in Malaysia, there's a, uh, there's a martial art called Warangdo, and the scrolls of Warangdo, all the books, the books that were the foundation of this ancient martial art, have about at least, that I know of, 5,000 moves. And a master of Warangdo keeps adding cards to his hand, right? You got to ask yourself, what kind of brain do you got? I got a Taekwondo brain. I can, I just want to throw it, I want to do one thing to just to perfect it. The other thing is, is I just can't absorb the idea of trying to learn thousands of moves is beyond me. And it's always been beyond me. Even when I say, well, now you're old and your brain is hard. Not really. It's just not the way I am wired. And if you're wired different than me, that's cool. I think all training should be customized to the student. Me standing here telling you you're not throwing a blow right because it doesn't look like me is foolish. Uh, one of my friends who teaches uh, Bujin Khan says, hands back feet. Your student can only copy two of those, period. If they're copying your hands and feet, their back will be in a different place. Back and feet, hands in a different place. And he's right. And his 16-year-old daughter tossed me around their front yard one Saturday morning when I drove down his place for practice. It was super awesome. It was really cool. Attention to understanding how you take in information, how you'd like to be taught, helps the teacher. Teachers should know that kind of stuff or be able to figure it out. But I try and customize all my training to the individual when I'm working with them. You know, teach them something, go off, work on it, come back. When you, when you feel like you can take more, over-teaching is the single, and that's why I was talking about here in the study and in the practice, five-minute drills are 10 minutes. If you spend an hour of practice drilling, it, we're not levies. We're not the Roman army where we're sitting here pounding posts because if we don't pound that post effectively, we're going to get killed. We're almost, you know, we fight a few hours a week and a few hours on weekends. So we want to maximize that. Study, practice, spar, fight. And the fighting is for the crown and all out. Now, how do you incorporate those people of different skill levels? Exactly what I said before. We have youth buffer fighters join our practice on Thursdays when we do the big bear pit. We run either two, two lists or one, depends on how many fighters we have. And we have those kids carry the boffers. Everybody understands, parents are there. Okay, when you're fighting the youth fighter, if they're div one, you're on your knees, single sword. If they're div two, you're standing single sword. If they're div three, depending on where they are, it could be a full fight. Kids love it. Parents love it. And I, you know, again, I want every fighter in sight in the pit. 
I want them to be part of that as an experience. And we cheer when anybody runs, whenever anybody beats everyone in the line, we call that running the table and we cheer for them. We bang our shields. You know, it's an accomplishment. And we need to all be lauding each other. This is not a scramble to the top for me. If I could teach you to be a better fighter than me, that is my ultimate dream. To teach someone to fight better than I do, that would be, you know, certainly would be pretty validating about all this, this stuff that I'm trying to teach people. But the idea there is, is we are all on the same team. Rapier, it doesn't matter. I take my rapier kit out a couple of times a year for sure and go train with my friends doing rapier because there's a lot of great stuff you can learn. Training is training. And once you get past the idea that training fits into some small box, man, it's as big as the sky in Montana. And that's what we got to get to as a community, you know? And I, I take my kit everywhere I go. It goes with me. And I'm always, I can find some place to train. So study, practice, spar, fight. Fix your bad practice habits. We talked about a lot of them, right? Don't, you know, I always tell people, this is another one. I, I, I tell this to a lot of people and I tell it to myself. It's okay to be your own critic. Don't be your own worst critic. Somebody will happily step into that role, especially if it's on Facebook. OK. You should critique yourself and fairly. OK, be fair. When I go to Crown. I say to myself, have I done everything to put myself in the best possibility to win? And sometimes the answer is no. Guess what? Don't do very well. It's not magic. But. I know what it takes. And when I don't do it, I know what I have not done. Maybe you get a little lucky. Again, statistics doesn't bear that out. <laughs> and I didn't even count the Dukes into our equation. Basically what it gets down to is about 30 or 40 people have won 60% of all the crowns. It's not even that many. I think the numbers, yeah, because you had the Dukes in who won twos. Counts are a rare commodity. I'm hoping to reduce the number of counts in this kingdom before too long, but we shall see. So this is what we're doing. More training, less talking. Drink a little water, get back in the list. Drink a little water, get back in the list. I'm really missing on Wednesday nights, I travel an hour, a little more than an hour over to Columbus. And I got some folks I really enjoy training with because they want to train. And, uh, you know, you can make little pockets of training. So Study, practice, spar, fight. Fix your bad habits, right? Fix your bad habits. You've got them. I've got them. And if you see me doing it, tell me. Again, part of what hurts training is that too many people think it's like it's like the NFL to the Super Bowl. There could be only one, and everybody else who didn't get it sucks. You know? Not true. What do you want out of fighting? Let's go to that goal. You want to just be better. Do you want to use it as a health aid? Do you want to go kick a bunch of keisters? And there's big difference in getting knighted and winning crown or getting your mod and winning crown for that matter, for any of those things. Those aren't the same thing. You know, part of it is understanding how training, it, when I train for crown, it's a lot different than I worked at getting knighted. Getting, getting knighted is a good example. I hear you, Andreas. Um, Getting knighted as an example is an exercise. Actually, getting any peerage is an exercise in getting around your kingdom, doing enough work in your chosen field to get a whole bunch of people who you don't know real well to suggest to the crown that you're pretty swell. Okay? A, a peerage is, a, if you want to fight well enough to get knighted or fight well enough to get in our kingdom, our uh, grant level award is called the Gold Mace. Captain Diederich's on this call. He's got one. I do not. Anya's got one. Yeah. Down below that, our, our AOA level fighting award is Red Company, of which I'm the premier. Most folks have that too. If, to be a captain, I have never heard of anybody getting a captaincy who wasn't a Red Co. So I don't think so. But 
those are goals that you can you can chunk out in your kingdom. You know, if you just want to, you know, if you want to look at them that way, they're not necessarily tickets that need to be punched, but they are good mechanisms to help you kind of train along. Yeah, first rule: show up. And that's the truth. And uh, if you can do that, you can get yourself to the point where you build, you're building a community. I can travel to the practice in Columbus three hour, or an hour away from me. We all know each other. I can go three hours to Cleveland. They're happy to see me, know all those folks. Five hours out to Peoria across the, across the kingdom. They all know me. You know, getting in the habit of taking your armor. And let me tell you, that folks that can excel here, the folks that do this are the folks that say, well, everybody bailed on me to go to event X or well, my partner, whoever was gonna go to practice with me, they might bailed out. And those folks throw their armor in the car and they go anyways, within reasonable limits of being safe and not driving your car off a cliff or something because you're tired, okay? But going when no one else wants to go, why? Because there's some knights who live out in that area where that event is. That's their annual event. And I've never met any of them. So Squire Boy jumps in the car. Maybe he has some buddies. Maybe he doesn't. Goes out to that event. Maybe, maybe I get stomped. But they'll know who I was because I made the effort to go there. It's not always within everybody's means to do all the time. But as a focused idea, the people in peerage orders can't Tell the crown that they think you're amazing if they have no idea who you are. And no amount of your knight or your peer talking you up gets that done. That's on you. So I approach all of this as opportunities to train. Who would, who would drive two hours for practice? Well, sure as heck not every week, but once in a while to make it out to a practice out somewhere as in Indianapolis, it's about two, two and change. I can do that by myself on a weeknight if I have to, you know, it's worth it. You don't have to do it all the time, but then you can hit a lot of these with people you don't know, which helps build that other fighting muscle, which is I don't clutch when I got to fight new people. So many fighters that I have encountered in my travels are awesome right up to the point. I actually traveled to an event about 10, 10 and a half hours away. And there was a, there was a gentleman there who, who had since been knighted. I've known this guy for 20 years, but I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he went out and just fell apart. And I'm like, dude, it's me. We trained together. Come on. But it just, you know, you get in that little click of who you fight with and you lose your, you know, you lose that. And that's a muscle. All of this stuff is muscles. So more fighting, less talking. Fix your bad habits, study, practice, spar, fight. If you just did this, if this is all you change in your training regimen, I guarantee you will improve. If you can get a partner or somebody who wants to train with you to help eyeball you when you're doing stuff or they note something, you know, when somebody tells me, hey, you know, you kind of towed in on that thing. Oh, I did. I didn't even realize it. Hey, thanks. Again. I'm all about team training. We will get a better product. The sum of us is, is far greater than anything one of us can do, no matter how good the one is. The group, people see things and you train and you trust people and they will tell you, hey, dude, you know, your shield was over here. What was it doing there? Well, I had no idea. You know, that's how we all get better. Which brings us a few years back, I was fortunate enough to go to the Arnold Schwarzenegger Bodybuilding Classic in Columbus, Ohio. It is one of the two premier bodybuilding events pretty much in the world. Okay. There's Mr. Olympia and there's the Arnold Classic. And my wife and I got VIP tickets. They were a chunk but one of the things we got was on Sunday, the day after we got all the prejudging, we got to, I got my picture taken. I actually got to chat with Arnold Schwarzenegger, super cool, very nice guy. 
But on Sunday, they had all these panels with the winners of the events and nutritionists and physical training specialists and Arnold. And I thought these things, there were gonna to be tons of people. Most of them were less than 30 people. So here I am sitting in a room where I can ask Arnold Schwarzenegger questions for an hour with 30 other people, most of whom are far too timid to say anything. My takeaway from Arnold was, and he talked about it, that every day, building blocks, cardio, weights. Okay, I'm not bodybuilding, but of course that guy won a whole pile of titles. He's one of the most recognized people in the whole world. He also said something, somebody had asked him, what about using drugs and steroids? And he stopped for a minute and said, I know a lot of people who used drugs to get to the top. I don't know anybody who uses drugs and stays at the top. Okay, maybe we're not using drugs, but we have some bad habits. Clean them up. Mine is diet. I exercise to eat as opposed to eating to exercise. It shows. But, okay, so got a chance to meet a legend of weightlifting, powerlifting in the United States. His name is Louis Simmons. He runs a gym in Columbus called Westside Barbell. The Olympic powerlifters. Yeah, Anya knows what I'm talking about. Uh, he was pretty old. I, I, I would expect he's still alive, but the, you, all the, anybody who wants to learn something from, to get stronger goes, when they're driving, they stop in Columbus to see this guy. And he has all these crazy things like having people doing, doing treadmill with 200 pound weight vests and all this stuff. And he, he talked about a concept, results oriented instruction, activity specific exercise. The idea is, okay, I want to learn, I want to learn how to throw a flat snap perfectly, very hard, very fast. Okay, devise training with a measurable result that is connecting, landing people who, you know, you don't throw hard enough. Okay, and then what are some exercises I can do specifically to get better at that thing? There's an excellent weightlifting book. And if you ever wanted to lift weights of any kind, little dumbbells. It's called Getting Stronger by Bill Pearl. It is the foundation book of all weightlifting for the last 60 years. It has nothing but exercises and what they do to your body and what they're for and has a whole section about sports. It's a great book. And I lift weights all the time. Um, and people say, well, you know, what do you bench? What do you, I have no clue. Mostly I use 10 or 15 pound dumbbells and I just rep to exhaustion. I want to be able to take a 10 pound dumbbell and do that 150 times, okay? Or I want to be able to do this. It's good for your biceps, overhead tricep extension. I rarely use more than 15 pound dumbbell ever. I just don't, it's not necessary. Most people are strong enough. The reason they can't hit hard enough is that their, their technique is poor. Guess what? You can fix that. But these two ideas, so if you want a skill in fighting, did we got to just, we just devise a drill that gets you the skill. And you do the drill a whole bunch and you get the skill. That's how I get all my skills. I need it. I need it. I noticed that this would be cool if I could do this thing. Well, okay. How do we do that thing? Now, it may not be possible, but most of the time it is. Results-oriented distraction activity, specific exercise. Tell me what you want out of fighting. We'll make something that gets you the thing you want so you can get to the next thing you want, so you can get to the thing you want past that for as far as you care to take it. Is it peerage? Sure, great. If not, just want to be better. That's an excellent reason. Just want to have more fun. Just want to not hurt myself, <laughs> okay? Hey, I'm up for all of that. It's all good. Okay. We talked about overtraining. I've seen guys, I mean, I've done, I don't know that I've ever been to six practices in one week in my whole life, but I have seen people do it. 
once, then you don't see him for a month. Here's, here's William's rule. Practice once a week, every week. 48 weeks out of 52, I will give you four weeks off a year, barring injury or sickness, okay? Get to one event every month if it is within your means. Slow and steady wins the race, okay? Slow and steady. Constantly working, building technique. Hey, if you can pick up an extra, te uh, extra practice once a month, you have five practices a month. Sweet. Most places practice is shut down around Christmas anyway, so you know you're going to have a couple of drop weeks. If the weather's nice enough around these parts, and that means if it's above 45 degrees, we fight out. We'll fight outside. Um, myself and one of my friends fought. We fought right up into November this year because the weather was wasn't the greatest, but it was it's okay. You know, masked up social distance, okay? But make opportunities to, you know, do the little building block things, okay? Don't overtrain, it's just bad for you. And the idea, you know, okay, I always say get one more fight, that's true. If you're at practice and, you know, if you, are you really totally blown up? If you are really totally blown up, sit down. But if you're not, slog out there for one last one even if somebody just hits you the point isn't winning or losing it's pushing yourself because what i will tell you is when you are tired study practice spar fight basics are what's going to be there for you i have won more fights with the most if, if you for those who know me that i don't have any fancy shots i don't know any fancy shots i've never known any i i just don't find a lot of value in it Works for some folks who can do. The other thing is, is I have really limited joint mobility. It's just a natural thing with me. It, it's not an injury or a handicap. You know, some of those people who can touch their thumb, I can't even get close. Okay, touch the thumb, to the arm, I can't even get close. Well, but my wrists are really strong to trade. So some techniques I cannot do, but I can do things that people, you know, again, I have, I have my things that are good for me and I have my things that aren't. I'm not particularly fast, never been fast. In fact, I'm dead slow. I'm almost always the slowest fighter at practice, but I can stick my sword point on a quarter. One of the guys that I trained with, uh, a gentleman uh, who I have uh, practiced commented, he said dimes, that there's a dime on your helmet and that's what I'm trying to hit. And if I can't hit that dime, I won't, won't hit you. And he hits me a lot. He's very skilled. And it's cool. Well, nobody else hits that spot. Well, but if it's there, if that guy could hit it, somebody else is going to pick that up. Guess what? More training. <laughs> okay. William's answer. What's my answer going to be? More training. At whatever pace works for you and your physicality. Okay. But understanding what you can do well, like I have super loose shoulder joints. I can, I could, I can yank them out of the socket real easy. So I do not ever, I don't do that. That's painful right there. I don't ever drive my shoulder past the line. I don't ever take my arm. So when I block something, I do it like that. Opens you up somewhere, but it's extremely good. It's fast. Instead of having to go like that, which is gonna hurt me, I can just tuck it and come back right out of it. And my hips turn and I power back out. That's a thing for William's body, the way it's built. You could complain that you can't do this thing, or you could just say, well, I can do these things, so let's focus on those. Remember, I'm over here in the Taiko. I just want to do this. I want to do this little box group of things really, really good. And I've never found anybody who's invincible. Never. They might hit me a lot more than I hit them, but I'll hit them. And again, some people say, well, you can't beat Duke so-and-so. Duke so-and-so fighting in crown. Oh, no, man, he's totally done. He said his wife's going to kill him if he fights in crown. Oh, well, I guess I don't got to worry about that guy. Okay. <laughs> Again, what's your goal, your training tailors to how you want to motivate down there? Overtraining. Pels. Overall, I am not a huge fan of the Pell. Although it was the way I was trained, I had a really good teacher. 
What I came to understand about Pels, and I just want to show you some real little things about Pels. So this here is nothing more than PVC pipe in a board with a little styrofoam ball, okay? You do not hit this pal hard, okay? Look at this. Beating the hell out of the pal is stupid. It can't hit back and it doesn't provide you feedback based on how hard you hit it other than hurting your wrist, elbow, and shoulders. If anybody's ever had tendonitis or epicondylitis and you are plagued with it, PM me, I'll explain how you fix it. Believe me, I've had to fix it enough times that I figured out what was wrong with my technique and I don't get it anymore on off, but I treat it, do some treatment. So power work like this is fine. I suppose I could try thrusting the tip, but this thing, it's a little goofy because that thrusting tip is just huge. But I also do a couple things at the pal. That's about my perfect Pell distance. I want to hit, that's actually, I can step back just a little bit and hit the sweet spot of the sword. And every time you throw a blow at the Pell, move your feet. Bang. Step away, step back. Bang. Step away, step back. I have never been in a fight, ever. After 1985, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that when fighting. Where I got to stand in front of somebody hunkered down and blast away at them and they didn't move a muscle. Except my knight, because defense was his thing. If you're gonna use a pal, help the pal simulate fighting. If you've ever seen any of those Hong Kong Kung Fu movies, which my friends all know I love, I collect, I'm a huge Run Run Shaw fan. The one where the guy does the thing and he's got the he's got the furrowed track and a big circle around his around his striking thing. That's not a bad way to look at it. There should be a track because I I don't want it. it it's not innately useful to me to sit here and do this over and over and over because. If I'm making a mistake, I'm making it over and over. And the other thing is, is I'm pretty sure my opponent's not gonna stand there. So I set myself and I throw a blow and then I move off. And I typically do my pedal work with a 10 pound dumbbell or my shield. Sometimes I just like to have a dumbbell so I can see everything a little better. It's also good if you wanna train some buckler, but have something that you're keeping. And if you wanna go the extra mile, my other favorite shield technique is a jump stretch, big rubber band, one of those resistance band things. You know, it's just a big rubber band and you hook it through your fingers, sort of like this. This is another one of these crazy training techniques. So I'm just using this bungee cord to demonstrate it, but I hook the rubber band over my second and third finger on each hand. I put it over my shoulders and then I bring my guard up. This is a little shorter than my band. And then I throw blows and don't move your shield arm. This is too short. Um, I don't know if jump stretch still makes the band, but you want a band that puts resistance right here and still allows you the movement to fully extend. That's what I use a pedal for. It can be a good tool. It can end up making your technique very bad if you're doing something wrong and don't know it. Um, okay. All the drills that I use are written in my manual. I'm not gonna bore you to death with them, but drills are good. Because again, what is the purpose of a drill? To teach you a technique. So as a quick example, if this weren't a weeknight, I would have my best friend Baron Collin here to help me. So like a great drill that we do a lot that the guy, everybody at practice enjoys. And you just do this, you run this drill twice. It's called run to 20. What it is, 
is the two fighters line up and set a distance where they can both strike. Level one of this drill is no foot movement. The attacker in the drill throws 20 blows as reasonably fast as they can, but not uncontrolled. Any type, any kind of strike, and the other person defends 20 blows. In the midst between blow one and 120, the defender gets to throw one shot. Because in run to 20, we occasionally see people are whacking away and since no one's swinging at them, the shield ends up guarding their ankles. So you just go bonk and hit them on the head. You can do it with boffers. These are, or typically we do it fully armored. It's not a full force drill. It's probably 60% power, okay? And then you switch. The defender throws their 20, becomes the attacker. And that's one pass of the drill. Switch opponents, run it again, okay? Level two is you're allowed one step. Defender gets one step as well. Why would we do a drill where we don't move our feet? The reason we do a drill where we don't move our feet is sometimes it's real. If I step in a fight, I'm telling you something. Wouldn't it be great? Somebody says, gosh, it sure would be useful if I could hit somebody from guard without moving other than my sword. Hey, why don't we devise a drill for that? <laughs> There's a bunch of good blows you could throw from your guard here or your guard here or your guard here. It doesn't really matter. But if I could strike at you and never move my feet, if I get into this line and set and I take your back leg, Take your back leg with a drop cross like that. Drive a hand across the front, cut down. I just legged my opponent and they, I gave them no, very little clue. There's a lot of good fighters in this game who watch. They watch you. <laughs> and some of them, they watch you and they see a mistake and they don't capitalize on it. And they put it in a little file. And then they let the fight proceed for a little bit. So you've forgotten about it, and then they pull it out and they gack you. Ask me how I know. Point is, there's reasons to do some of these drills like this. Run to 20, at level one is no foot movement, 20 blows, one defending blow. At level two, one step, two defending blows. At level three, two steps, two defending blows. It's just a drill. Everybody likes it, you know? There are key or sometimes people, you hear people talk about trigger drilling. Trigger drill is we sit in guard until I think I, you know, we can shuffle our position at a given distance until I think I have an opening and then I just strike. And I don't have to hit you. I just, was that, would I have hit you and your opponent? You know, okay, yeah, you got me out of position. You can do a modified Tai Chi push hands drill where you both are trying not to open up. We do this drill a lot. It's another one people really like where we're just keeping, you have to keep hand to hand contact and I can push. But if I get like this and show my corner, I lost. And I know I lost and my opponent knows I lost and you do this, but you know, you don't need a ton of armor, crazy gear, heavy weapons. You know, you can, you can create again. What does that teach me? You know, a lot of fighters step across their own line, which, which point you're dead. That's the end of it. You know, for anybody who's been fighting a long time, you see all the fighters with all the dents in this quarter panel of their helmet. It's because they stand like this, where their body faces the wrong way. Opponents here, where should your where should your line be? It should be right there. And people, you know, I, I had somebody tell me, well, you can't possibly generate any power from here. Okay, let's see if I can generate any power from here. And they had nothing for it because my sword was so close to them. Nobody fights that way where they are. And we had a good conversation and we're friends about it. I said, I'm not trying to prove anything here, but I won crown with this technique. And I, there's about 20 guys here who won crowns with this technique. It works. Don't say it doesn't just because you don't understand it, you know, but there's still, there's still a lot of this technique, Old Castle. You know what that tells me? Must work. And you see somebody fighting like that and you don't respect the idea that they can deliver something through that line that your shield edge to your face may or may not save you. You're going to lose that fight just like that. So 
all the forms and techniques of drilling, whatever drill we want to do. If we want to do a drill from here, we can do a drill from here. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no sacred cows. Tomorrow night, if y'all are interested, part two of this, we're going to delve into some very, not some very, delve into some of the little harder to grip on parts of what I think training is and what I think about our sport. The problems, the good, the bad, you know, the system about it. I don't defend it or, uh, or say against it. It's just the system we have, how you get knighted, what it takes in most places, um, how you excel, how you cruise up the rank of fighters, some of the mental aspects of that. Um, but we got a few minutes and I'm honestly, I rearranged my schedule this evening. So we don't have to, I don't think we have to drop it. If anybody would like to ask some questions, I know that that was a huge data dump. <laughs> At least I hope it was. Um, but if you've got a question, please, especially the folks who aren't from the mid, most of the mid round folks are fairly familiar with how I train. But for you folks who have taken time out of your schedules to join us this evening, I would be happy to field a few questions. I see a lot of names I don't recognize. So please, if you'd like to ask a question, please unmute your mic and anyone? I'll open it up to the mid folks too. I just wanted to see if any of our, our, our more distant students tonight. Tomorrow night though, we'll talk about, and, and I will answer any question you have at the end of tomorrow night session, any question. There's no, again, no sacred cows. Um, there's a lot to our sport. And- Michael so, ha or Michaela has their hand up. Oh, okay. Michelle. Yeah, that's that's Michelle McClowry. Yes, Michelle. Sorry, your video is off, so I didn't see you waving at me. Hi. Hi. Ask a question. Uh, well, does it make sense for someone such as me to start training in this? I'm never going to fight in a tournament, but being able to somebody. Absolutely. Appeals to me. <laughs> A big part of this fighting uh, thing is the camaraderie in the community. I know we have, I am, Freddie, you have a question to go with that? Um, just after, I don't know, I'm just trying to, I don't I know. Got you. Okay, <laughs> let me just finish, yeah. A big part of this is just being part of our community and lots of folks train and don't fight tournaments. If it's something you wanna do because you think you would enjoy it, then by all means. And I'm still, the weather turned, I, I, we've had so much bad weather. I still have your sword and everything. I haven't cut any swords for you or me. And I'm waiting for the weather to just clear a little. I got to come out and put your pal up. Okay, Freddie. Hello, I'm just wondering if you have any um, basic training tips you would give for someone who's an absolute beginner with no experience outside of theater. Outside of, did you say theater? Yeah, I did stage fighting for a little bit, but I feel like that's probably not super applicable. I think all training is applicable, varying degrees. So in the basic part of this, and where are you from? I live in Toronto, or um, Efferwich. Okay, I've been there, yep. So the first thing is, is having a social group that you can train with comfortably when you're new. Decent armor that protects uh, all the reasonable points one of the things I think a lot of novice fighters uh, mistake that they make is they come out uh, in minimum armor and they end up getting more banged up in the sport than is really necessary. So not just an absolute basic, basic kit, but van braces, thigh armor, um, chest protection, because I wear, you know, and a lot of folks I know, who I, like a lot of people I know don't wear chest protection. I always wear chest protection because in a lot of these cases, it's the incidental bumping of shields and things that'll bruise you up here. And I said, I got pretty tired of that. Shoulder armor, I would not fight without shoulder armor. I would, I would do without other pieces of armor before I did without shoulders. A good, if you can get one something, uh, this is a padded gamason. Mm -hmm. You can make one out of a moving, uh, moving uh, pad. It'll work. Oh, that's quite clever. 
I had this, this was made by uh, the lady in Moscow, Quilted Armor on Facebook. She does fantastic work. It's not cheap, it's well worth it. This thing fits me well and, uh, and it, that layer of protection over underneath a piece of armor. You know, it's almost like those people in medieval times understood how to keep themselves from getting injured. <laughs> um, I have a second question, but Antonio Disforza put their hand up first. Okay. Um, hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the class. It's been really informative. One question that I do have though is for people who are on the newer side, how long after their authorization should they really be traveling to fight the other people in their kingdom outside of their immediate group if they're on the path to knighthood or the mod uh, or, or archery or equestrian or whatever other co uh, combat sport that they're in within the SCA? Is that something that you only really do when you've established that you're the top dog in your local group? Or is that something that you should be doing when you're like a brand new beginner and just have free time to travel? Or do you have to have like some level of skill that there are some people that you can reasonably beat and others that you're not before it's really worth your time to make the trucks out to the far off lands? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so in my opinion, Skill is less important than awareness, understanding how your kingdom works, understanding kind of how the groups work, how's your kingdom system, uh, kind of. I don't think it has a lot to do with skill. In fact, my early travels, uh, I'm pretty sure I had almost no skill. I, I thought I had skill, but I was sadly mistaken. Um, and so I think getting out and traveling is how you find the SCA, how you really experience and you make friends in these other places and when I was much younger at this I went very humbly hey can you help me train troop around and ask folks first hey I'm working on this I've, I've and you can you know it's a, fighting is a social activity so one thing I always do is I would say something like well I really I've always admired your shield technique perhaps you could take a moment to explain it to me you know and don't you know don't hit them as, you know, as soon as they come off the field and they're sweating and barely able to breathe, but find a little in and understand that fighters love to talk about fighting. The fact that anybody asks them a question is, is carte blanche. You may get your ear talked off for a long time, but we have this community where we do these weird things and uh, a duke in our kingdom, Duke Dog, always says, we probably have more in common with each other than we have with our blood relations. And in a lot of ways, that's very true. I probably have more kinship to everybody on this call than I have to some of the people who I'm related to by blood because we do these things. So I think the only thing, you know, is just, do you have a decent understanding of the SCA ranks, you know? People with shiny hats, you understand the difference between a Duke account and a Baron, you're good. Get out there. If it is within your means to visit other groups, you know, and be honest, you know. I have not, I've found the SCA, the SCA, you know, I've not found a lot of places where anybody gets taken unfairly advantage of in these sort of cases most of the time. You say, hey, I'm, I'm fairly new at this and I'm learning and I took a training class with Count William of Arium from the Middle Kingdom, he suggests that I ought to travel a little more. And most everybody who does this will go, oh yeah, yeah, probably the thing to do. And, you know, sometimes people can't help you, but my dad always said, you, you don't get anything you don't ask for. So just step in politely and say, oh, I really, I'm really interested in this aspect of the sport, perhaps you could show me some, some things and believe me, I don't think you'll have too much trouble. Did I answer your question? You did indeed. Thank you so very much. You're very, very welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Anybody else have a question? Well, a comment on that one is just that also the more you travel, the more likely you'll find someone that actually trains you the way you like to be trained. Very true. Very true. Do you have another question, Freddie? I do indeed. This might be a little bit out side of your purview, but um, how would your period 
persona influence the armor that you wore for training? There has, I know there's like a standard set of safety required, but if you're from a different area or time period, how would that influence what you wear? Doesn't, um, it not at all. So my, uh, my, the period of my persona, William of Fairhaven lives in 1175 England in the town of Fairhaven. My, my original persona was earlier, 1075. My wife's persona was French Norman before she got her laurel in Anglo-Saxon studies. So she took her period closer to mine. We dress entirely in 900 AD ish, eight, eight to 900. And my kit is 14th century because I like the armor protection to be perfectly honest. There are plenty of protective kits for earlier periods. It's armor should be a hundred percent about what you like. And my garb, you know, nobody, I've never had anybody in the SCA say, well, you sure don't look like an 1175 Norman. <laughs> We wear Anglo-Saxon garb because that's the period my wife really likes and my armor reflects the armor I prefer, mostly for its protective qualities and it just looks darn cool and it really, really protects. Uh, but I am gonna make a, an Anglo-Saxon transition kit. My former champion has had a bad effect on me and Baron Hengist wants me to make a transition kit, so I'm gonna make one. You can wear whatever kind of armor you want. No, you're, you, those two things are literally separate. They can be the same if you wish. If you want, William, I can bring that up the next time we're having that together. Hey, aren't you an 11th century Norman? Why are you wearing that late period stuff? It, uh, it fell through a time slip, and I'm the best armored guy in my whole period. Uh, so, yeah, and tomorrow night we could spend a lot more time. I wanted to, this is a foundation class to kind of get you acclimated to what what I think training should be. And tomorrow night, since I, we, I was actually able to get two class slots, we can delve into some far more, we can go di deep dive into pieces parts. And I have some other stuff I'd like to talk about like calibration, blows, uh, you know, problem solving on the list, problem solving off the list, the system, how it works, you know, what the SCA is, what it is not. And uh, again, I threw my email in the uh, chat. If you'd like my training book, it's under construction, but it's uh, reasonably organized. It has a lot of other stuff. It has pages and pages of drills and footwork diagrams. And uh, it has all my knight's rules collected. My knight was Duke Comar Gear Moran. I mean, he's still my knight. I'm just not a squire anymore, but uh, he had all these one-liner quippy things that he would say all the time. and I repeat them because they're drilled into my brain. And one of the squires in the household said, well, what are they all? What, can you write them down? I was like, hmm, okay. Took a little while, you know, so things like that. Anything else? Anybody? Wide open. What about, um Beyond the training, this is Michelle. Here, I'll yeah. put my video on. You. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, beyond the, the training that you'll do in preparing to fight, uh, you had mentioned weight, cardio. Can you talk for a moment about that type of training to get ready to do the other type of training? So, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So here's, here's my very simple rule of fitness. This is as simple as it gets. 30 minutes of cardio every day, five days out of seven. That's the start. Nothing will improve your fighting like cardio. You will get stronger from swinging swords and wearing armor, but there is no substitute for cardio. And I hate cardio, but guess what? I do cardio every day. I rarely take a day off. I'm currently on a two day hiatus because I had a tonsillitis flare up and I'm on, I'm on, uh, antibiotics for 10 days. So I gave myself three or four days to let everything settle. But, uh, and you don't have to run, walk, walk is fine. 30 minutes, 20 minutes minimum. But I try and do 30 minutes. If you have a treadmill or access to something that does interval cardio where the treadmill 
changes elevations and speeds, great. If not, uh, slight incline is always nice, but walk, walk around the block. Start as small as you want, but cardio, 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 cardio. And when I'm getting ready for crown, I do a crazy amount of cardio because my arm may get tired, but the more my body is used to aerobic activity, the faster and stronger, my, my muscles will recover faster because they're used to the oxygenation level. So when I do cardio on my treadmill downstairs, I wear a balaclava mask, three layers heavy, and I wear my body armor, which is about 18 or 20 pounds. And I wear ankle and wrist weights, two pounds each to do my 30 minutes of cardio. Sucks a big bunch. So that's first thing. Lightweight, basic dumbbell exercises. Again, uh, the book, Getting Stronger by Bill Pearl. And if you just do some, I do curls for the biceps. That's good for your, that's good for holding your shield. Bicep strength. Sword throwing strength is a tricep exercise. I happen to like overhead hammers. Okay. You can do some dumbbell deadlifts for your back. It's down to the floor, straight up and back. Same thing holding. You can use 12 ounce soup cans for all that matters. Wherever you want to start is fine. You can do shrugs. I do a lot of shrugs because you're wearing a harness of armor. You just make sure, and again, form is everything with these. You don't need fancy weights or anything. I, I bought a bunch of dumbbells at some second time around sports. I think I made a dollar each. You don't have to spend a lot of money and you can make, you could literally make your own uh, or use something handy in the house. Somebody was, I, I was doing some of these Indian club exercises and so I, I went and looked at these things. They're like 50 bucks online for two, two pound Indian clubs. So I went and got two claw hammers, which weigh about two pounds, because <laughs> I got plenty of hammers around my house. Yeah, you, know, you do a curl with a 12 ounce soup can. You know, you don't have to do anything fancy. Um, below the waist is walking and cardio, above the waist, light weights. And I do lots and lots and lots of reps because, again, in this sport, what's valued? Yeah, hitting power is important. And there's going to be people who, you know, I've had to go hit some people excessively hard. If you want to learn how to do that, I can teach you. I actually teach a class on power generation and heavy so that you can hit people. I love, I, I have enjoyed greatly through the many years of teaching little tiny small fighters, not all women, small frame fighters, how to hit people really hard. Because sometimes when you're small, that's what you got to do. It's just the way the system works, but. I want to be able to just throw that sword. Bam, 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 bam. I just want to be able to throw it a lot of times because sometimes those fights drag on. You bump into that fighter that you're very even with and nobody can really get an, an advantage. The person that wins that fight will have the one who has the better cardio. Guaranteed. But lightweights and simple stuff. Bill Pearl's book, Getting Stronger, is the best book I can recommend. But you can just... Search some very basic uh, dumbbell curl. I, you know what? I probably ought to write those all down in my manual. So dumbbell curl, overhead tricep, deadlift shrug, delt raises. The delt raise is uh, you have a weight and you hold it and you just raise it up to your side like this. Even with your shoulder, never above. The delt raise, that's another one that's good for swords and shields. You can do it in front of you, nice and smooth. And you can do it slightly behind you at an angle. It's a rear delt. It's a deltoid. It's got three muscles. So you have the back muscle, the side muscle, the front muscle. That front deltoid muscle protects you from injury. That's a key one for protecting your rotator. So I do those. And again, I, I, have, a, I, I have a bunch of one and two pound dumbbells. They get the most use of any dumbbells I have. And people say, but you're so big and strong. Yeah, but that, that front delt muscle is about that big, <laughs> okay? You know, the idea of picking up some ridiculous huge weight is going to injure you. Just light weights, lots of reps. Make your muscle durable. Build flexibility and build endurance in the muscle. Okay. And I just ordered the book, so. It's a great one. It's It's been, my wife and I got it when we started weightlifting together 30 years ago, and it's still the book we use. 
you don't need anything else once you have that book. Okay. Okay. And feel free at, and any of you, I'm on Facebook. I am on email. I live on computers. I'm always online. Seems like if you have a question, you, you are, please send me a question. If you have a question, don't, don't muddle it through it. I mean, it's again, team effort, cooperate and graduate. My dad always said that cooperate and graduate. And we will all get better together as a group far faster than any one of us can get better on their own. So I'm always available for questions or anything that I can do to help any of you. Believe me, I have, the SCA has given me everything I could ever have dreamed of. My job is to help everybody else at this point. I still got to win a crown for my lady. Want to win another crown. We had a lot of fun being king queen. We would like to do that again. Will it happen? Hard to say. We got to get back to having crowns, <laughs> but we will. <laughs> we will. But yeah. So any other questions? Anything I can answer before we knock off? And then we can pick this right back up for any of you who have time tomorrow night. We're going to pick it back up, delve into some, some deeper concepts and discussions and maybe some slightly less comfortable places about the sport. Thank you, Freddie. I appreciate that. Let's see. I'll have to look and see. Who did you put up, Cope? Oh, did Cope jump uh, off? That's uh, Gilad. He does the total body, body sculpting. Uh, it's been around since my baby was born. Uh, but I do his videos and they, they always leave me sore, but they seem really easy when you're doing them. And then the next day you're like, ow. <laughs> I know the first time I tried the Indian clubs with this guy teaching, it looks like Jason Momoa. And he's just like, oh, and then you just do this and this and this and this. And <laughs> I was like using one pound. I was using little one pound ball peen hammers. And the next day I thought my arm was going to fall off. Yeah, but I find builder mobility. Being, So, I say being a little bit older, finding things that are not tearing out my joints is important. I, I can't do 40 push-ups anymore. Heck, I can't even do five push-ups right now because my shoulder doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I, I suck at push-ups and always have. Um, again, is, is push-ups required for me to win crown tourney? No, then I don't, I'm not worried about them. This is back to what Louis Simmons said about activity-specific exercise. He had a, he did a demonstration at the Arnold Classic. He had a young lady there. She weighed 123 pounds and she benched 323. 123 pounds, benched 323. And someone said, well, how much could, how much could she deadlift? And he said, that's the stupidest question you could ask. Which That's not it. She's the world record bench presser at her weight. That was her goal. So that's what we worked on. We don't care how much she can do. De Does deadlifting help you be the bench press champ? Nope. Then we ain't going to do it. As you work on technique of any kind, what's the goal? And if it's not helping you, if it's not helping you on that goal line, that goal path, it's out. We, have, we all want to do too much. Focusing effort. And again, our limited amount of time. We got spouses we got significant others and partners we get grandkids we got pets we got jobs we get all this crazy stuff so when we're working on our fighting it's got to be honed in to a pretty narrow track so that when you're doing it you get the most out of it that it actually moves you forward too many people are trying to push the ocean i'm not trying to push the ocean i want to go right through it Okay, so that's how we train. Freddie. It's interesting because every exercise, even with the exercise bands and with the clubs, is an exercise that I do for my circus training in contortion. Obviously not the flexibility part because you're not aiming to touch your foot to your head while you're sword fighting, but all of the conditioning and the flex, like the range of movement exercises are exactly the same. Well, in flexibility, the added, and I'm not particularly flexible. I do do some yoga, but flexibility training is another good hedge against injury. It's hard to hyperextend things if they're more flexible. Most mm -hmm. people run into those styles of injuries in the sport because the joint doesn't have the mobility. That's why I'm, 
I use very heavy half gauntlets on my wrists to keep them from not going where they can't go. And I've done it, you know, still in the sport. So that, if that's training you're doing anyways, and it's, it, it, all the physical stuff you do of any type, if you like yoga, if you like uh, planking, if you like running, all those things are good for fighting. There's none of those that I would say, oh, don't do that. There's a platform level basic of what's good, you know, basic cardio. The big problem is people attempt to take on these enormous fitness regimes and then they try and fight on top of that and they fail at both. So like William always tries to set, I always try and set these. Here's the goal. I tell people, if you could do five minutes of Pell work every day between practice. So if we have practice on Tuesday, I want you to do five minutes of Pell practice, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we're fighting again. You'll be stunned at what six days of Pell work, five minutes at a time will do for you. you say, I'm going to get an hour on the Pell. And then they don't do it because like, well, I don't have an hour. I keep a guitar next to my desk at home. And sometimes I have five dead minutes. I pick up my guitar and I tune it and I strum it and I put it back. But I put my hands on that guitar every day. That's what this is. It's all the same. It's, there's no difference. So if you can hit the pill for five minutes and you know, like, okay, when I say I do half hour at treadmill, it's really probably 40 minutes because it takes me five to get down there, five to put my stuff on and five more to take my stuff off because I'm wearing all the stuff. I do that all in, sweat, in a sweatshirt and sweatpants with a balaclava in the basement. But I am, by far, I am not normal, which is okay. I have some things I very specifically want. And I have found that it, through training, I can get them. But the basics of it is 30 minutes of cardio a day. And that was Arnold Schwarzenegger, 30 minutes of cardio, 30 minutes of resistance. Okay, how about 30 minutes of cardio? Let's see if we could just do that. 20 minutes of cardio minimum. Can you do that? 10 minutes. If you're, and the other thing that, that this is the mentality thing as a fighter that I developed a long time ago, I beat fighters who I think are better than I am a lot because I work harder. You didn't work as hard as me. Believe me, I'm pretty sure most people are not working as hard as me. Now they're out there, they sure are. But in most cases, very few people are working and fighting as hard as I am. That's well, an fun. advantage. It's one thing we don't tend to think about. We don't tend to think about ourselves as athletes and changing that mindset to saying, well, if I'm going to do this, I have to be an athlete. And then treating your training, treating your diet, treating everything as part of being an athlete. All of a sudden you change how you think about what you're doing. And athletes, athlete means a lot of things. You know, you're participating in a sport. So at the minimum, I would say you're an athlete because you're in a sport. You know? Maybe all you can do is five minutes of walking a day. Start with that. I am not too worried. I'm not here. I will never be the guy cracking the whip. I love fighting in ways that are probably not always healthy. And even there, even for me, there are days when I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And I could find a thousand reasons not to do it. And yet I go do it. You know, and so anybody who doesn't love fighting at the level that I do is not point, there's no point in driving people. Now, if you want a reminder or some help, and I will always, I will take time out of anything I'm doing at an event other than Crown Tourney to help you train. If I'm on the list and you got your, you got anything, if you just, all you got is you're, you're just in garb. We'll grab some boffers. We can do, we can work. Training is training. doesn't matter to me. You know, um, so keep that in mind. And uh, if you all can, anybody cares about me, I'll be on tomorrow night and talk about the rest of this conversation. And we will be getting back to having our hobby. Vaccines are starting to come along. Yes, it's slow. Yes, we all want it to be faster, but it's coming. And when it does, I can tell you what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be training. And I would love nothing more than to train with all you folks. As much as that is reasonably possible, some of you are quite far away, but one never knows. I'm going to try. I've got some students way out in the western part of the kingdom, and I got a bunch of friends. You know, Antonio, you're 
in Anstiora, but I got a bunch of friends that live out uh, Dallas, Possum Kingdom, and uh, Wichita Falls. So I got to make it. I want to make a trip out there. That's on my list. So, and we're coming. We're uh, my friend Duke Gabriel is is on. He's down in Australia and is in Brisbane. His lovely lady and all of his crew. My wife and I are putting it together to do a trip out there. I want to go there before I'm unable to go there. And one of the things I'm going to do is take a, take a few pieces of the kit, and I'm sure that they'll have everything else I need. So, yeah, think about yourself. You know, this is sport. We can treat it like a sport. Yeah, I, I diet is easily my weakest link. I make up for it by training really hard. Some of the folks on this call train with me and know how hard I like to train. And I don't mean hard like hitting hard. I mean just repetition of training. Yeah, <laughs> Diederik's like. <laughs> But it is something you all can do. Believe me, it, if you'd have seen what I looked like fighting in the early 80s, if I could get knighted, anybody could get knighted, really. And I had a terrible attitude, too. So we can. Uh... Well, sir, I have to get ready for work. Nice meeting you all. All right. Good night, Dietrich. I, uh, thanks. It's good to see your face, buddy. Good to see you, sir. Hopefully I'll make it tomorrow. We'll see. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to shut it out here. Uh, and thanks to Gabriel. Yeah, we will plan this. This will be dated down because the other thing we want to do is, uh, is see a game at the GABA. So we're coming to Brisbane, see you and your lady. And we might check down to Sydney to see something at the SCG, but y'all have a good night. If you need anything from me, hit me up, PM me, send me a friend request or email, and I will send you training manual. And I'll be back on tomorrow night. We can talk a little more. Hope you all enjoyed this. Thank you so much. 